Hi, everyone. Welcome to a breakfast club, I guess lunch club if you're on the East Coast. This is episode 50 somehow, and we are so happy to welcome Dr. Jessica Ware, curator at the American Museum of Natural History. Hey, Jessica. Hi, thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks for coming back on. Um, also a very special welcome to everyone watching on the American Museum's own Facebook page. Um, we're so glad to have you. And, um, you know, Jessica, today being Groundhog Day, I wanted to do at least one thing that went on forever and ever. So I thought I would read some of your other accolades. Um, in addition to being an AMNH curator, you are Vice President of the Entomological Society of America, DEI Director of the Society of Systematic Biologists, Board President of the Worldwide Dragonfly Association, and Co-Founder of Entomologists of Color. Um, so besides making the rest of us feel terrible about our use of time, um, <laughs> can you tell us a little bit more about your actual, like more specific area of expertise and um, what you're gonna cover today? Sure, uh, thanks so much, Laurel. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, so I specialize in, in I guess, studying insect evolution. Um, and the insects that I mostly work on are dragonflies and damselflies, um, but I also work on termites and cockroaches. So I did my PhD on dragonflies, and so I kind of feel like they're my, they're my most favorite of the insects, but I'm kind of interested in insect evolution kind of across all insects. Okay, excellent. And in addition to kind of talking about that work today, it sounds like the small preview I got, you're also going to kind of cover some bigger kind of biodiversity concepts and just things that people, um, and if you don't know what I'm talking about, you can just go with it. But what I was excited <laughs> about when I saw some of the things you were planning to talk to is just there are a lot of kind of concepts and ideas and schools of thought that we use in natural history, but often don't actually take time to explain. So I think this talk is also really cool because it'll give people a framework for understanding other areas of research. Um, I hope so. Plus, I mean, we're gonna, I think I'm gonna, if there's time, I'm gonna uh, take a just a moment also to talk about the other aspect of diversity. I mean, biodiversity is super important, but also diversifying entomology is super important and something mm -hmm. I'm passionate about, so. Yes. Thank you for that too. Yeah, and we will put links to everything as you cover them in the comments section. And I'm actually going to give you your slides and get out of here. But that reminds me, quick note to all viewers, no matter what page or platform you're watching on, you can ask Jessica questions at any time. Just leave them in either Facebook comments or if you're on YouTube in the chat box. And at the end of her talk, we'll loop back and I will ask as many of them as we can. Um, so with that, I'm going to give you your slides. And I will get out of here and I'll see you at the end. Jessica, thank you again so much. Thanks, Laurel. So I'm excited to talk to you about um, my research program, which mostly focuses on dragonflies and damselflies. And like I said, a little bit on Dictyopter, which include termites and cockroaches. Um, and I would just say that, I mean, this isn't, it's not like it was my life's work necessarily to become an entomologist. Um, I didn't come from a family of people who were doctors um, or academics in any way. Uh, but my twin and I, we were partially raised by my grandparents um, and my Nana, who's you can kind of see in this photo here. She really loved the outdoors and so did my granddad. So they spent a lot of time taking us around in Northern Ontario um, out in the bush. Uh, and that really kind of made me think that I did not want to have an office job. I didn't want to have the type of job where I didn't get to be outside for at least part of it, um, which of course is what we do as field biologists. So I'm a field entomologist, a field biologist. Um, and what that means is that I kind of travel the world uh, to collect the insects that are relevant or important for the studies that I'm doing. Um, and in collecting these specimens, it allows us time in the field to kind of observe them and look at their behavior and their appearance and uh, their ecology. Um, and in doing so, that usually um, kind of astounds us and, and reminds us just how many species of insects there are. Um, so like Laura was mentioning, um, you know, biodiversity is this, this, this idea, or this concept of, of the, you know, how many species are, are, are present on earth. Um, and, and we kind of categorize these or, or group these into piles. Uh, you know, humans like to sort things. Um, and we've kind of sorted life into these different piles. Um, and when we look at insects, I mean, there are more insects than there really is anything else on earth. We have a million described species of insects, but we think that there might be 5 million or up to 30 million species of insects still left to be described. Um, it's kind of a debated topic. How many species of insects are still, are still out there waiting to be discovered? 
And this is huge. These are huge numbers. Um, when we compare them to things like mammals, it's only 6,400 species of mammals. There's less than 10,000 species of birds. We know an awful lot about birds and we know an awful lot about mammals um, or about snakes or frogs or, or, or even plants, which is, you know, compared to mammals, there's a lot of plants, but compared to insects, there are not a lot of plants. Um, so when we look at this, you know, and we we realize that there's more than half of the the species um, that are present on Earth are insects. It kind of um, I think underscores why entomology is a vital science and why we should all be studying it. Um, and certainly, when you go to the field, whether it's you know downtown Newark in New Jersey um, or northern Ontario or you know southern Australia, what you notice when you look at insects is um, a lot of variation. So there's variation in size and color and shape um, in the types of things that they eat from being blood feeders to herbivores to being predators. Um, and in this huge amount of variation, um, we can start to ask questions. And certainly, you know, as a kid, I had these types of questions. Um, you know, I didn't phrase them in, in the way that they're shown on this slide because I was, you know, my twin and I were not uh, like I said, really schooled to be to be scientists. But we did notice whenever we went out with my nan, wow, there's a lot of insects. <laughs> I wonder why there's so many. Um, I wonder if there's always been insects on Earth. Um, I wonder why there's so many different kinds. Well, we can phrase those as more sophisticated questions. And this is what I basically still am asking um, as a research biologist, as, an, as a curator at the American Museum. How are insect orders related to each other? When did they diversify? Um, and then what may have been some of the drivers um, of this diversity that we see on Earth? Not all insect groups are really diverse. Um, and so this variation is something that we are really interested in. And so to get at these questions, I mostly focus, like I mentioned, on a couple of taxa. So um, the Odonata is an order of insects that includes dragonflies and damselflies. And the Bladodea is an order of insects that includes the cockroaches and then these social cockroaches, which we call termites. And so to study these kind of the evolutionary history of these insects, what we do basically is we make family trees kind of, we make phylogenies um, and we use fossils and we try and put, you know, molecular morphological data together so that we can get at these questions. You know, how are insect orders related to each other? Um, and then the when question, you know, when did insects first diversify? And what we end up doing is we make these things called phylogenies, or sometimes you, you might hear them being called as trees. Um, and basically, they're a way, a graphical way of showing how we think different groups are related to each other, um, with things that are closer together in the tree being more close relatives. Um, and so if we look at the insect tree of life, this is an insect tree of life that colleagues um, and I um, made in 2014. This part here where the red circle is, this is um, the area where we would find dragonflies and damselflies. So if we zoom into this part of the tree, we see that we recover Odonata, the dragonflies and damselflies, as sister to the mayflies. Um, and they're among the first branching um, you know, groups within the larger group of winged insects. Um, so probably the first things to take to the sky, certainly before there were birds, bats, or pterosaurs, um, they were, there were insects. And it probably was something that was dragonfly-like. So the order Odonata, um, we have broken it up um, as scientists into three different subgroups. Um, the Anisopter are the dragonflies and these tend to have kind of like a stocky, thick abdomen and they tend to hold their wings out to the side at rest. Um, and there's around 3000 species of those. Uh, the damselflies um, have very slender abdomens and they tend to hold their wings behind their back when they're at rest. Um, these are the Zygoptera. And there's around 3,000 species of those. And then there's this third suborder that exists today only as a single genus, Epiaplebia. Um, it's found with four species in China, the Himalayas, and Japan. Um, and it's called Anisozygoptera. So in total, there's 6,300 species, the same number of species as what we see for mammals, right? So it's around the same number of mammal species as there are odonate species. But we know an awful lot about mammals. Um, which I think is always kind of interesting. More people don't get jazzed about dragonflies and damselflies. Um, much cooler than pandas, I would argue. 
So just like when we look across insects and we see a bunch of variety, you can look across dragonflies and damselflies and notice the kind of remarkable heterogeneity in size and shape and color. And a lot of dragonflies use color. Um, they use color as signaling, males signal to other males, males and females signal to each other. Um, sometimes the color is on their wings in terms of wing patterns, but sometimes there's colors that are actually in their body in their cuticle or their skin. Um, and sometimes their color actually can change for thermoregulation, becoming lighter or darker, or for crypsis. And certainly, I mean, the the bright coloration that you see in dragonflies, that's probably one of the things that people um, find most attractive about this group. Um, and unlike many other insect groups, people have been using dragonflies because they're pretty, because they're beautiful. Uh, they've been using them as decorations uh, for a long time. So, you know, Tiffany used them in Tiffany lamps. We use them for jewelry. People have tattoos of them. People use them for fabric and, and pottery and what have you. Um, and I think the reason why these are so attractive uh, to people is because of the striking wing venation that they have. They have very remarkable wing venation patterns, but again, also this bright variation in color. And you'll notice that in all of these beautiful decorations that people use dragonflies, um, they don't often use the juvenile stage. They only use the adult stage. Uh, so the juvenile stage, by contrast, for all damselflies and dragonflies, it develops in fresh water. Um, and so the nymphs or larvae, as they're sometimes called, um, they hatch as eggs, females lay their eggs in fresh water, and then they hatch, and then develop over a series of weeks, or sometimes even multiple years in fresh water. Um, and as nymphs, as larvae, uh, they're voracious predators, just like the adults. Um, so they have these mouth parts called masks, or labial masks, um, that kind of shoot outwards, grab food, and it brings it you know, back towards um, the mandibles for, for consumption. Um, and what's remarkable is that these dragonflies and damselflies are excellent at, at eating the things that we don't like. So they're e excellent at eating mosquito larvae and other fly larvae, but they also are good at eating vertebrates. Um, so they can routinely take fish, um, tadpoles, as you can see in some of these photos here. Another thing that's kind of remarkable about odonates that I think attracts a lot of people to want to study them is their reproductive biology. Um, so most um, organisms, when we think of organisms um, in across the class Insecta, um, we picture them having kind of traditional reproductive patterns where males have a single penis um, uh, from which sperm um, is produced and uh, given to the female for reproduction. But actually in dragonflies and damselflies, it's different. Uh, they have indirect sperm transfer um, where males actually have two penises. So they have a penis at the tip of their abdomen um, and then they have a penis at the base of their abdomen. Um, and this secondary, so they have sperm that's produced at the tip of the abdomen. They ejaculate and put the sperm into the base of the abdomen. And then males and females come together and they form this kind of heart-shaped um, uh, coupling called the copulatory wheel. Um, and females will put her genitals on the secondary penis and the secondary penis is where the sperm is transferred. So because the sperm isn't transferred directly from that first penis, it's called indirect sperm transfer. And that's kind of a unique thing that just dragonflies and damselflies have. But there's more <laughs> in terms of strange reproduction. Uh, dragonflies and damselflies also have this um, a uh, unique tool on their secondary penis. Uh, so females can mate multiple times with males, different males, um, and she can store sperm in these sperm storage organs um, inside of her body. Some is for short-term storage and some is for long-term storage. Um, and so males want to try and ensure paternity. Um, natural selection should act on um, you know, males ensuring paternity. And so there's been selection on the secondary penis to also act as a sperm displacement organ. So before males actually transfer sperm to females, they scrape out the previous male sperm um, using these kind of cuticular expansions, using these hooks and finger-like projections that are on the secondary penis. Um, so when you see dragonflies and damselflies together in that heart-shaped copulatory wheel, um, the bulk of what they're doing is actually the male <laughs> scraping out the previous uh, male sperm before he uh, actually transfers his, um, his reproductive output to a female. So um, as Laurel mentioned, it is Groundhog Day, um, the day when 
a mammal takes center stage yet again with mammals. Um, and there's this myth, I guess, that this prognosticator or prognosticator, uh, this groundhog would be able to predict spring. Uh, and I thought I would just mention that, you know, there are better animals that one could use to actually make predictions of whether or not spring is here. Um, what better than dragonflies? So um, there's a couple of dragonflies that routinely, like clockwork, kind of fly in early April. Um, all dragonfly nymphs develop, you know, are overwintering. Um, and uh, in this part of, if, of New Jersey and in the Northeast, they overwinter. And so when you see adults actually out flying, those are adults that have emerged. Um, so Annex Junius, shown here on the left, um, and the dot-tailed white face, Leucarinia intacta, shown here on the right, these are both really early flying. They, they fly early in the season. And if you see those, it is spring. So way more predictable than uh, any groundhog in terms of, of whether or not spring is here. Um, and so basically what happens is females will lay their eggs and then the eggs or the nymphs, more commonly it's the nymphs or larvae, uh, will, will emerge and then they will overwinter throughout the winter. And depending on the species, they actually can, and depending on the part of the world um, where they're developing, they actually can stay frozen solid in ice below pond or lake surface um, for, the, in t for four to five months for the duration of winter. Um, as long as the temperature in these frozen, you know, they can be in these these blocks of ice, but as long as the temperature doesn't fall below, you know, minus five or minus six degrees Celsius, um, which would be lethal, uh, then these nymphs are actually, as soon as the, the ice block melts, they're able to, you know, swim around and start feeding right away. Um, there's a lot of work that's been done um, on this phenomenon in Canada um, and, and in Europe, Northern Europe. So what we know about dragonfly and damselfly relationships um, is really in thanks to uh, the dragonfly systematists or, or people who are interested in systematics. Um, that's kind of the discipline where we look at how different organisms are related to each other. Um, and most of what uh, systematists have done, most of what dragonfly workers have done, is they've looked at wing venation. Um, the same reason that wing veins were kind of attractive to the Tiffany when uh, the Tiffany company was making, you know, those beautiful Tiffany lamps, wing venation kind of is an obvious character that people could look at to try and distinguish uh, among dragonflies, to try and sort dragonflies into different piles. Um, and certainly there's a lot of wing vein patterns that w are immediately visible. There's, you know, these different shapes in the wings that kind of vary from taxon to taxon. But over time, as humans also started looking at the aerodynamics of flight in dragonflies and damselflies, we realized that the density of wing venation actually impacts how stiff dragonfly wings are. So in parts of the wing where there's a lot of dense wing veins, um, that actually is a stiffer wing and that can be very useful, especially if you're doing long distance or gliding style flight. Um, and having less or sparse um, venation in parts of the wings makes the wings kind of more floppy. Um, and so there's some, um, you know, idea that perhaps these patterns that we see of wing venation in the wing, they're not necessarily a reflection of evolutionary history, um, but instead maybe they're in part at least a reflection of um, the kind of um, constraints of, of the flight behavior of that particular dragonfly. So we've kind of started to move away from using just wing vein morphology to try and um, understand how dragonflies and damselflies are related to each other. Um, and one group, I mean, the, the entire suborder of Zygoptera, um, which is a really, I mean, they're, they're not my favorite Odinate, but they're really overlooked um, and underappreciated group of, of insects. Um, they're basically, their relationships within this suborder, um, it's basically chaos. Um, so if anyone ever thought, what should I do with my life? Uh, I'm not sure I'm really going anywhere. Have I got a job for you? you know, understanding how dragonflies um, are related to each other, we're starting to come to a bit of a better understanding of that. And I'll mention that in just a moment. But in terms of damselflies, it's largely um, a mess. So we need more people to be working on this group to really understand there might be 50 families, um, 50 different piles, 50 different types of, of lar large groupings of, of damselflies um, and how they're related to each other is, is really, um, really still a mystery. For dragonflies, it's a little bit simpler. Um, there have been 10 families that have been kind of described. Um, 
And in large part, we we have a pretty good understanding of how the relative position of these different groups of dragonflies um, are in the in the dragonfly tree of life. But there's a couple of nodes that are really challenging. A couple of dragonflies uh, that we really just don't understand where they fall in this tree of life. Um, so I'm going to kind of briefly talk about uh, the diff these different main dragonfly groups, um, kind of give you uh, behind the scenes, behind the music, <laughs> dragonfly edition, right? About some of these dragonfly groups. And, um, and then I'll show you what we think we know about how they're related to each other. Um, but the really difficult groups are the club tails, which I've illustrated an example outlined in green here. The petal tails, an illustrated an example outlined in purple here. Um, and then this super family called the Libelluloidea, which has four families and they're outlined in this blue color here. So um, the group that we think is sister to all of the rest of the dragonflies are the Aeshnidae, probably the earliest branching lineage within the dragonflies. These include um, things like the migratory Annex Junius. That's the one that I said was a good groundhog replacement because it usually flies early in the season. Um, there's around 450 species of this in this family. Um, then there's the gomphidae or the club tails. Um, and these are called the club tails because at the base of, at the tip of the abdomen, males have this kind of expansion that kind of looks like a club and that's how they get their name. Um, but these, there's, there's tons of these. There's, there's over 900 species. So talk about species richness. Um, there's a lot of species of gomphids um, and they do something kind of strange in the way that they lay their eggs. So all damselflies and most dragonflies um, actually lay their eggs inside of plant material um, that's in the, the freshwater systems where, where their larvae are going to develop. But these club-tailed dragonflies, by contrast, they don't actually do that. They just kind of squirt out their eggs in a clump and then tap their abdomen on the water and then fly away. Um, like I mentioned before, you know, there's not an even species richness across taxa. Some things have a lot of species, others have very few species. Um, and the petal tails um, are one, it's a family that has very few species. So I mentioned club tails have 900 species, petal tails have just 10 just 10. There's two in North America. Um, the majority of the diversity is, is in Australia. Um, and these are actually really large dragonflies. They're among the largest dragonflies that we have on earth in terms of mass. Um, and they're, they're among the biggest dragonflies that we have here um, in North America. And what's kind of remarkable about these, um, I'll just give a little side note, is that uh, there was a graduate student that, you know, under mysterious circumstances, disappeared while studying these these dragonflies. Uh, he became convinced in the Pacific Northwest where he was um, trying to sample one of the North American taxa, he became convinced that they were the primary diet of Sasquatch. Um, and um, if people are interested in that story, I can always tell you more about that later. Uh, but it's hard not to think of these and, and think of Sasquatch. And then the other group is this really large super family that has these four families um, and there's 1500 species. And what's interesting is a very, very high number of species. It's also one of the, it's the other group that basically lays its eggs just by squirting out a clump of eggs and it doesn't use plant material. So if we wanted to try and understand how these different dragonfly groups are related to each other, we use these, these trees, these phylogenies, these trees of life to try and kind of, I guess, better visualize how we think um, certain groups are related to each other. Um, so this is an example of a dragonfly tree of life that colleagues and I um, reconstructed. Uh, we did this for 136 species for close to 500 genes. Um, and we were excited to reconstruct this phylogeny because we, like dragonflies and damselflies, we wanted to understand how they were related to each other. But really, outside of maybe our immediate family, who would who would care that we made this phylogeny? Who who would be interested in this phylogeny other than kind of a diehard dragonfly person? Um, well, I just wanted to show you an example of what one could use a phylogeny for. These phylogenies are actually really useful. They're kind of a vital science um, because they allow us to test hypotheses about the questions that we might have about behavior or ecology or geographical distribution. So for example, um, like I mentioned, there's variation in the way that dragonflies lay their eggs. So all damselflies and most dragonflies lay their eggs in plant material, but some, the gomphidae, which are the club tails, and the libelluloidea, instead, they just squirt out their eggs in a clump and tap their abdomen on the water. And those are 
the most species rich groups within Anisoptera. Um, so we might want to ask the question, well, what was the ancestral egg laying strategy in Anisoptera? And perhaps is the loss of this of this egg laying inside of plant behavior, is that what allowed them to become so speciose to have such high biodiversity? Well, one of the other hypotheses people suggested in relation to egg laying was that maybe, um, you know, having a reduction in the egg laying apparatus, it's called an ovipositor, perhaps having a reduction in the ovipositor and just squirting out your eggs in a clump makes you less likely to be eaten when you're at the water. So females fly to fresh water to try and, you know, find places to lay her eggs. Um, and they're routinely taken as food. Uh, fish jump out of the water to catch dragonflies and damselflies. Frogs, lizards, birds swoop down. Um, there's kind of a constant um, buffet, a smorgasbord at fresh water and dragonflies and damselflies are on the menu. Um, and so, you know, laying an egg with an ovipositor or an egg laying apparatus where you have to cut a hole in plant material and put your eggs in one at a time is very time consuming. And so some have suggested maybe having this reduction in the ovipositor, this modification where you just squirt out your eggs in a clump, maybe that actually is, because it's very fast, it's a very fast way of laying your eggs, maybe that allows you to uh, more efficiently escape pred predators at the water. But we can't really answer a question, these types of questions without a phylogeny. You really do need a tree. You really do need a dragonfly tree of life to answer these types of questions. So if we wanna know whether or not um, this egg laying strategy where you have a reduction in the ovipositor, you just squirt out your eggs. It's called exophytic egg laying because it doesn't require plant material outside plant, exophytic. Um, if dragonflies from the club tail family, Gomphidae, are sister to the Libelluloidae, if they're really close relatives, both of those are the ones that have this reduced ovipositor, that means it just evolved once. But if instead Gomphidae uh, or the club tails are sister to the Pedaluridae, that's that really species poor group, the one that's the Sasquatch food, um, if they're sister taxa, that means that this uh, this behavior, this reduction in the ovipositor and squirting out your eggs in the clump, that means it evolved twice. Um, and so we really kind of need a phylogeny so that we can answer this question. Um, so if we look at our tree of life that we reconstructed for dragonflies and damselflies, and we zoom into the area of the tree um, where these families are located, what do we find? Well, we, we actually find that pedalurids um, and gomphids, the club tails, are recovered as sister taxa um, with really strong support um, with, our, with our data set. And what that tells us is that this reduction in the ovipositor, this, this modification to squirt out your eggs in a clump, it evolved twice. It evolved once in the club tails and then again in the lipoluloidea. Um, you can do this, you can make, an, as many trees as you want to make. You can make it with data like we used here, these 500 or so, uh, close to 500 uh, genes. You can also use transcriptomes, which my postdoc man Preet Kohli and I did, along with colleagues from OneKite. Uh, we used transcriptomes with another larger data set, over 2,000 uh, genes. And if we look at what these data show in this tree of life for dragonflies, again, we recover pedalarity and gomphidae as sister taxa. Again, this reduction in the ovipositor, it seems like it's evolved twice. Um, and when we look at when that may have happened, we can actually use fossils and we can use this molecular data to try and um, estimate the age of when specific groups first diverged on Earth. Um, and we see that the reduction in the ovipositor occurs in groups that diversify during the time period when we see a rise in modern birds. Um, so during the Cretaceous period, we see the rise of modern birds, which are nasty predators on dragonflies and damselflies, I might add. Um, and so perhaps, um, you know, more data is needed, but perhaps, you know, this, this is some evidence that around the time when we see this kind of burst in, in speciation, this reduction in the ovipositor, we're also seeing the rise of a, of a very um, a ubiquitous predator at water, the birds. So you can also use these phylogenies, um, you know, not just to test questions about deep time, about things that were happening, you know, during the Cretaceous period. You can also use molecular data like this um, to answer questions about what's happening right now, 
you know, for a variation among populations or individuals. Um, and so this is an example um, that we've where we've done this uh, for a dragonfly called Pentaliflovescens. It falls somewhere within the family of Libellulidae, although we're not exactly sure um, where it where it fits in the in the dragonfly tree of life. But what we know. This is a photo taken by my late colleague, uh, Greg Lassley. Uh, this is a photo of Pantella migrating. What we know is that they're great at dispersing um, and they're really long distance migrators. Um, regardless of where you are um, on earth, unless you're in an unless you are in Antarctica, um, you probably will be able to go out and, co and collect Pantella this summer. Um, they are called the global wanderer or wandering glider in their common, as their common names because they really are cosmopolitan. Um, so the genus Pantella has two species in it, Pantella flavescens, which is the one that's everywhere. Um, and then there's Pantella hymenia, which is its sister taxon. Uh, and it exists from Canada down to Argentina. And I mentioned before that some dragonflies actually will spend, you know, multiple years developing as nymphs. Well, Pantella, by contrast, are very quick. They have a very short generation times and they develop, you know, five to six weeks. Um, and that's in part because they, take advantage of temporary or transient bodies of water that kind of emerge after heavy rains. Um, females will kind of swoop in, um, lay her eggs, and then the, the, because those bodies of water are bound to evaporate um, at any moment, they're ephemeral by, by nature, um, you know, there's been selection on this very rapid development time for Pantella. There's also been selection um, on certain morphological features that we think are related to long distance flight. So um, dragonfly wings, like I mentioned, have these variation in the venation pattern that might be correlated with certain styles of flight. Um, and Pantella is no different. So they have this region, which I've kind of colored here with this red um, overlay. This is a region of veins called the anal veins. Um, and they have kind of an expansion of this region of their wings. Um, and we think that this might be increased surface area, surface area, which could decrease, um, you know, the energy that they're using when they're doing long distance gliding style flight, which is mostly what they're doing. So they're really long distance migrants, um, but they're not flapping you know, their wings, the whole 11,000 kilometers or however long their journey is. They actually take advantage of winds that go around the equator, the intertropical convergence zone, um, and they mostly are just kind of gliding. So when wind passes over the surface of their wings, they have a behavioral adaptation to pick up their, their tarsi, to pick up their feet um, and be carried uh, by, by the wind. Except that when colleagues went to kind of remote islands, um, Tonga or Easter Island, um, uh, what they noticed is that, again, it was just mostly anecdotal data, mind you, but they noticed that Pantala wasn't doing that behavior. So on these remote islands, um, they tended to crouch down uh, when wind passed over the surface of their wings. And our colleagues thought that maybe um, they were doing this to avoid being swept out to sea. And so, um, these are the type of questions that I would have asked when I was a kid. Again, I had, wasn't raised with a lot of science background, but um, I would have probably wondered why are they everywhere? And that was kind of what a, the, like a, a kernel of an idea that popped into my head when I was a graduate student because the first time I went to the motherland, to, to Africa uh, for, for an International Congress of Odontology, I was so excited you know, as a descendant of, of, of slaves that were brought here, I was so excited to go to Africa. And the first dragonfly I caught was Pantella flavescens, the same thing I caught when I was in Australia or Canada or New Jersey. Um, and it really made me wonder what exactly is a population when you have something that is so cosmopolitan and global in its distribution. So with colleagues, we've sequenced um, mitochondrial genetic information um, for these, uh, for Pantella sampled from across their range. So we've sampled the colors that are, the the, the countries that are colored um, with different kind of dots here on the, on this map here. Um, and these figures that I'm showing you are what's called a haplotype network. And what that basically is, is it's a drawing that kind of clumps together genetic patterns. So each circle in this drawing is a different genetic pattern that we found across all the Pantala that we've sampled. The bigger the circle, the more individuals share that pattern. So what you can see is that the majority of individuals share this one main genetic pattern and the circle has different colors in it and those 
correspond to the different countries from which we got the Pantala. So regardless of whether we got them in Guyana, in South America, or Australia, or Texas, the, the majority of the individuals that we sampled shared this one main genetic pattern. Um, and the different genetic patterns that were found differed by usually just one to three nucleotides. So regardless of whether we look across countries, continents, or hemispheres, what we see is widespread gene flow among, um, among populations of, of Pantala, which suggests um, in order for there to be gene flow, uh, there's reproduction. So individuals are interacting in some way across this broad um, global range. Um, and I'll just note that a, a, a funny story is that a friend gave me um, a Pantella that landed on the side of this hot tub that she was in when she was on a, a cruise ship in the, in the Indian Ocean. Um, and I sequenced it and it has the same genetic pattern, the same main genetic pattern that the majority of the Pantella seem to have. So you can look at other kind of parts of the body of dragonflies to try and see if it gives you clues about their dispersal or their migration. Um, and I mentioned that, you know, nymphs or larvae, they develop in fresh water um, and they go through a series of molts until they molt to an adult and then they kind of fly away. So their wings actually develop while they're in fresh water, while they're while they're nymphs and they're kind of bunched up underneath the larval skin. And so the hydrogen that's in the wings of dragonflies, of adult dragonflies, actually is laid down while they're in the water as nymphs. So you can look at the weight of hydrogen in wings, which actually varies, the weight of hydrogen varies along a longitudinal and latitudinal gradient, um, longitudinal and latitudinal gradient. Um, and you can look at the weight of hydrogen by burning, cutting off the wings of your dragonfly and kind of combusting it. Um, and then it can tell you something about whether or not the adult that you collected, say you collected it in downtown New Orleans, you can see based on the weight of the hydrogen in that wing, whether or not that adult emerged from water in New Orleans or if it emerged from water in Canada or if it emerged in, from water in, in Senegal or Guinea-Bissau. Um, and so we did this for 20 locations um, for which we had Pantella across six continents. Um, and what you can get with these data are things like this, where there's these kind of heat maps that show uh, what the predicted hydrogen weights would be for a region. And you can compare that to the hydrogen weights that you get for the dragonflies um, that, that, you, that you burnt that you burnt up, <laughs> the wings for which you burnt up. Um, and so what our data show, um, what our data show, uh, was this pattern where the majority of the dragonflies that we sampled, and we sampled from across these countries that are shown here, each one indicated with a different colored dot, the majority of the individuals um, had hydrogen weights that predicted that they were from somewhere else. So the adults that we collected were not born in the region, were not emerging from water in the region where we collected them. The ones we collected in Guyana were from somewhere else. The ones we collected in Senegal were from somewhere else. There were a few individuals from the Andes that did have kind of a local signature. And so we want to kind of expand our data set um, and see whether or not this holds up to be true across seasonal sampling. And I'll just mention my graduate student, uh, Stephanie Mofla Mills, um, has been working on looking at variation in the actual wing venation and, and size and shape of wings across kind of continental and island populations of Pantala. And so with all of these data, I think what we're kind of converging on is understanding the true tree of life for dragonflies and damselflies, um, and then using these trees so that we can answer questions about behavior, reproductive behavior, flight behavior, and also to better understand our questions about dispersal. Um, but the next, I think, most pressing thing that we have to focus on in entomology is really looking at the, the diversity among entomologists themselves. Um, so I'll just mention, you know, this is a photo that was of a, of a group of sharecroppers. Uh, this is my grandmother um, who was a, a sharecropper in Mississippi. Uh, our family was brought over as part of the slave trade. And, you know, as sharecroppers, they had really intimate knowledge of entomology, really by necessity, because their livelihood depended on being able to combat things like boll weevil um, and other pests of, of crops that sharecroppers um, grew. And I don't think anyone in this photo probably would have predicted uh, that, that you know their descendants would become 
uh, entomologist. This is a photo of my twin and I uh, when I was uh, honored and, and fortunate enough to be selected to visit the White House to talk about um, the PKS award I got for my, my entomology work. Um, to go from, you know, in just a couple of generations, uh, sharecroppers to an entomologist that's lucky enough to be recognized, to be able to do this for a full-time job and, and to be paid for it, um, is kind of remarkable. And I use the word remarkable because there are very few of us actually who are people of color um, in entomology, and there are even fewer of us who are who are black entomologists. Um, so colleagues and I, uh, we actually looked into the data that are available um, across uh, kind of scientific disciplines, but with a focus on entomology. And the data that we could get um, kind of groups entomology and parasitology together. Um, and this is a figure from a paper we published this summer um, where it shows a proportional representation uh, for white for African-American and for Latinx people um, in these different disciplines. And each circle um, kind of has uh, a, a certain amount of gray in it. And the more gray in the circle, the higher amount of underrepresentation you see. So if you look for black or African-American entomologists, you can see the circle is mostly gray. There are very few, there are very small numbers, um, extremely high underrepresentation compared to what's proportional in the human population um, for Black and Hispanic um, or Latino, Latinx um, researchers. And so to get at, at a solution for this, yikes, right? Uh, it's not because there's a lack of interest. You know, data has been, you know, people have collected data kind of across evolutionary biology and ecology. Um, social scientists and, and, and biologists have collected data, and there is not a lack of interest uh, by people of color to want to do entomology and to want to do ecology, to want to do evolutionary biology. Um, uh, there's a problem uh, that has to do with recruitment and retention. And so to get at this, um, we, uh, the entomologists of color, um, we started uh, last year uh, an initiative um, called EntoPOC Fund. Um, you can find out more information about us at entopoc.org. Uh, but we basically fund free um, memberships to entomological societies to any student of color. So you can go to our website, um, and there are different forms you can fill out for all the different entomological societies worldwide. And if you don't see one, you can um, just let us know which one you want to become a member to. Um, and we do this so that that way students of color um, who are who are budding entomologists can get access to journals, they can get access to conferences, um, and the networking that goes along with with interacting with other entomologists. And we also couple this with a visibility campaign by highlighting the students that receive these free memberships, which we use the hashtag entomology instars um, or entopoc instars um, on social media. Um, and so far, we've given away over 300 student memberships to entomological societies. Um, another initiative uh, that is coming up uh, is the Black and Entomology Week. So throughout the last year, there were several Black and Neurobiology Week, Black and Chemistry Week, Black and Birding Week. Well, finally for entomology, it's our week, uh, which is February 22nd to 26th. Um, and there'll be a bunch of different events that will be taking place throughout the days uh, for each of the days that week. And you can find out more um, on our Twitter hashtag uh, Black in Ento um, or in our website right there. Uh, certainly other, you know, our scientific societies, I think, recognize the value and importance of diversity. Um, societies like the Entomological Society of America recently put out kind of special collections of research by Black entomologists. Um, so you can go to their website and, and find out more and read some of the papers if you're interested. Um, and there's a, quite a few papers by someone who's my heroine or my hero, uh, uh, Dr. Margaret Collins, um, who I just want to give a shout out. And I guess I'll, I guess I'll, de I'll dedicate Kate, this Breakfast Club talk to her. Um, this is someone who also worked on termites, um, uh, which, which I do. Um, and she was the first African American woman to get a PhD in entomology. She received it in the 1950s at the University of Chicago. Um, and she ended up uh, kind of having a life of termite, of termite science and biology, um, as well as being very involved in the civil rights movement. Um, and eventually going to work at a, as a research associate at the Smithsonian. Um, and she died in the field collecting termites, doing what she loved. Um, and there's been much that's been written about her. Um, and she's definitely someone uh, to note, especially in uh, this the beginning of, of Black History Month. So, I mean, ultimately, 
the work to try and recruit, to try and retain diverse entomologists, the work that we're doing as field biologists to try and reconstruct phylogenies or better understand how dragonfly populations are related to each other. The purpose behind all of it, you know, the kind of thing that ties everything together is just this desire, I think, to really understand the natural world and the, the desire to make it so that everybody has the opportunity. Everybody who's curious, who wants to understand why are there so many dragonflies? Why are, why are there so many ants kind of on my Nana's porch? That natural kind of curiosity um, is something that we want to foster. Um, eventually, you know, leading them to become hopefully entomologists and joining this great discipline um, that has been um, you really protecting food security um, and humanity uh, for centuries. So with that, I will say uh, thank you to um, my collaborators and vendors. Um, thank you to uh, the people, my colleagues that I'm lucky enough to work with every day uh, in my lab uh, and my former colleagues who have graduated. Um, and if there's time, I'll take any questions. Oh, we've got time. Do you have time? <laughs> I have time. Okay. Um, <laughs> thank you so much. That was amazing as always. I um, just the glee that you take in phylogenetic trees and in the amount of data available <laughs> and all this stuff is just so inspiring. Um, and just to follow the, the last section that you talked about, we had a lot of viewers that asked, um, beyond connecting with Ento POC and supporting things that way, as museum goers, um, how, can they, how can people further support diversity in STEM or in STEAM? Oh, that's a good question. Well, I mean, Certainly, I mean, as museum goers, uh, you can you can attend talks that are there's there are people of color who are working in the field and uh, who are who are black entomologists or who are you know black in whatever ology that you want to list there um, and supporting their research, you know, um, promoting their research um, and using your voice to advocate for for more of 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 their research. I think can be really useful. Um, and then there are programs that I mean, a lot of a lot of people would argue. Uh, by the time you get to graduate school, you already kind of know maybe that you want to be an entomologist. Uh, the work maybe is retaining you, but you've already been recruited. Uh, but there's a lot of work to be done in terms of recruitment. Um, and there are museum programs that aim just specifically at that, at getting K to 12 participation. Um, and uh, so supporting, you know, museum efforts for K to 12, either through donations or through other types of support can be really, can be really helpful. Um, you gotta hook them young on entomology. Yeah. Kids start out loving insects, I might add. Right. Uh, but then during the, teen, during the teen years, their teachers and colleagues, you know, at, at, at high school convince them that it's not cool. Um, so we wanna try and counteract don't let your kids learn about insects on the street. You know, they need to learn about them at a museum or somewhere where they're gonna get good facts. That's what you want. <laughs> okay, um, excellent, thank you so much. Uh, so housekeeping, I think all of us agree we probably can't move on until we talk more about the Sasquatch story. <laughs> yes, so Perry Turner was uh, uh, an, a, an entomology uh, student, a candidate, um, for his PhD at Berkeley, um, and he was working on Tenipteryx. He did one of the drawings I actually showed was one of his beautiful biological illustrations. Um, and spending a lot of time in the Pacific Northwest, he became convinced that you know Tenipteryx are rare, petal tails are rare in the habitat, and he became convinced that they were the primary diet of Sasquatch. So Sasquatch are rare, he argued in his thesis. Sasquatch are rare because because their diet is rare in the habitat. Um, and yeah. he had a lot of diagrams, you know, of Sasquatch and humans and triangles with an eye in the center and 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 dragonflies flying around. Um, and he disappeared, you know, it's kind of a sad story. I know someone who, uh, you know, suffered some other issues, I guess, uh, but he was a, you know, could have been, you know, the the peddler and biologist um, on the path he was going, but he disappeared in the Pacific Northwest and hasn't wow. been seen from in a long time, in in decades. Um, wow, wow, that area swallows up a lot of a lot of interesting people and um, <laughs> spits out a lot of really interesting stories. Um, do you think? I guess next question: um, Chaotic Zygoptera, good name or terrible name for a new metal band? I think chaotic zygoptera could be also an excellent tattoo. I'm just saying uh, yeah. it could be an excellent tattoo. It could be an excellent metal band. Um, you know, when colleagues and I, we decided we were going to try and um, 
simplify the nomenclature and taxonomy. Oh, sorry for my dog's barking. <laughs> simplify the nomenclature and taxonomy um, of Zygoptera in, I think maybe it was 2013 or something like that. And we thought maybe there was, you know, 10, 13 families. Now there's 50. I mean, they just keep throwing more and more families. So if you want to describe a family, uh, and you want to have that go down forever, you know, that you've named a family, that's the group to work on because there's a million families left to be named, apparently. I'm exaggerating, but there are a lot of families left to be named, so. That's so cool. Um, okay, so getting into viewer questions, Matt asked, what are some of the most endangered odonates in North America? Did I say that right? Yeah, that was very, it was perfect pronunciation. Um, well, I mean, in North America, one that's kind of like, um, I guess like a poster child for endangered dra endangered dragonflies is Somatochlora um, hynei, which is the Heinz emerald dragonfly. Mm -hmm. um, and they're so cool because they're a cordyleid. So that's a group of dragonflies called the emeralds and they have these bright green eyes and they're kind of metallic in color. Um, but the nymphs live in fens in this kind of fen habitat. And many humans want to use fens just by draining them, use them to for agriculture. So routinely humans have kind of gone across the United States and drained the fen habitat to plant corn or soybean or what have you. Um, and that uh, has destroyed the habitat for, for Heinz Emerald. So now it exists in really restricted populations. Um, it's listed as an endangered or threatened dragonfly. Um, and it's, uh, it's, I mean, it's kind of remarkable. They live in burrows that, that are crayfish burrows. Um, oh, wow. And so <laughs> there's a guy who's, uh, uh, Tim Voigt is his name. Um, he's an active participant in the Dragonfly Societies of America. And he has a technique where he kind of pumps out these crayfish burrows uh, to look at the nymphs and see, you know, kind of estimate population sizes. Uh, it's really remarkable. But there are others that are, that are, you know, similarly not not doing well. And there's a lot of local extinction. So the petal tails that I just talked about, there's quite a few uh, uh, populations of the of the one that exists on the West Coast, mm -hmm. but on the East Coast, it's Tacopteryx, um, and it's basically we think extinct in New Jersey. It used to be in New Jersey. People built condos on its habitat, and now, I mean, there's, there's always rumors like, oh, somebody saw one last summer, but right. no confirmed populations. We think it's locally extinct. Okay. You're such an engaging speaker that I find myself sitting here and just like smiling widely and then realizing that what you're saying is actually very, very like not good. <laughs> Sorry if my facial expressions are like reading like a psychopath, everyone. Um, okay, great. And so here, let's see, I was gonna ask this good one from, um, so Edlin asked, do tropical dragonflies tend to grow larger than their temperate and Arctic counterparts? Oh, that's a very good question. Um, well, I mean, certainly there's a huge size variation kind of across the order. Um, some of the biggest ones that we have happen to also be in the Southern Hemisphere, um, like Pedalarity, uh, the ones that are in Australia, the Pedalara, they're they're like the size of a sparrow. I mean, when they fly by you, oh, wow. I was there in Australia collecting them when, uh, uh, for a grant that my advisor had when I was in grad school. And I was often confusing birds with <laughs> them because they're very heavy. And there's also the what's called the giant helicopter damselfly, which are very, very spindly and thin, but they're wide in size. Um, they're also in the tropics. Um, but there's lots of examples of tiny things in the tropics too. Um, and there are examples of big things. Epi Aishna heroes is a pretty big Aishnid, uh, and you can get it in New Jersey. Um, so there's big Aishnas that you can get in northern uh, Manitoba. So I think there's a lot of variety in size. Okay, cool. There, so we got a lot of questions about specific to field work and just what the experience of actually tracking and catching um, your study subjects is like. And having seen you in the field also, I think like net catching technique, is it like a gentle swoop or like a very aggressive strike? Tell us everything. Oh, that's a good question. I don't know that there's like a one, one for sure way to catch dragonflies. <laughs> um, if you want to, like your greatest chance of catching them is when they're in the copulatory wheel. So when males and females are together mating and they fly together to the water while they're still attached to each other, they're clumsy. They're busy yeah. doing other things. I mean, their weight balance is totally off. Um, and so you have a better chance of catching them um, if you don't mind interrupting uh, what they're doing. Um, so that for as a beginner dragonfly, I would argue that's the way to go. Go sit by the water and try and catch ones that are in a in the wheel kind of clumsily right. 
flying around. Um, but I, I have a, my former graduate student, Melissa, she always went, I think this is right. She always went from below. Like she somehow put her net beneath them and then swung her net upward. My former advisor, Mike May, he always went from the side. He would say, hold your net and go from the side. That was how he used to say it. Um, I, I like just going down from the top, you know, sometimes. So yeah. I think just keep swinging it until you get them. <laughs> okay. And then, you know, just to address the other question in this area, when you do go to the field, what is your goal generally and how long do you spend there? And, you know, what are you doing in the time that you are um, out there? Well, I mean, it's changed a lot over the of my life. So when I was younger, um, children, uh, I wanted to go for as long as I could go for, you know, I went right. at times I went for three months, you know, um, and now uh, that seems less and less possible. I mean, I have teens now, but it's still still a little bit tricky. I don't want to be away from them for that long. Although I have taken them with me to the field and they're mm -hmm. very good at collecting They've gone with me to South America. Um, so now normally when I go, it's kind of go in, get the taxes that we want to get and get out. Right. Um, in a relatively quick amount of time in a week or two, um, which is a bummer because part of the great thing about being in the field, if you have time, is that you get to sit and make observations. And observations usually lead to questions and that can lead to more research. Right, right, okay. Um, I'll ask this one from Laura. She asks, have scientists seen any change in insect migration routes due to changes of weather and wind patterns due to climate change? Well, um, not really migration routes, but certainly where we find dragonflies has changed um, in part because of changes in climate. So dragonflies respond very quickly to climate change. Um, when the weather gets bad, they leave or they go somewhere new. Uh, so many dragonflies have expanded their ranges. Um, things that used to be found in Northern Africa are now found in Sweden and what have you. Um, but then also because of strange weather, we often find things blown off course. So you find things much like there was a snowy owl in Central Park and people right. don't understand why. Wow, the? It's the same thing for dragonflies where suddenly you'll find something that you don't usually find in New Jersey, but it turns up here, a single individual that's been blown kind of off course. Okay, okay. Um, and Jeremy would like to know whether entomologists have any prevailing theories on why there are so many more species of insects than other animals, evolutionarily speaking, he adds. Um, why there are so many more insects than other species? That's what he wrote, yes. Well, I mean, part of it is time. You know, they've been around for a really long time. They've been around a lot longer than, than mammals. Um, Part of it is, you know, size variation. Um, they can exploit a bunch of different niche spaces. So they are right. in water and they're in the yeah. air and they're in the canopy and they're in trees and they're in deserts. And they kind of have really radiated to kind of be everywhere that you could possibly be um, on the planet. Um, and, and then they've had some kind of key innovations that like once they, key, key, key adaptations that once they occurred, there was like a burst of radiation, a lots more species, and then another burst, another burst. So, you know, not having wings, insects, uh, the insects that don't have wings are very, not a lot of species of basal hexapods. Um, right. And then terry goats so that have wings, boom, there's a, more terry goats than anything. And then complete metamorphosis, that was an innovation. You know, having uh, <laughs> your life divided up into yeah. egg, larva, pupa, adult, Boom, hola metabola, tons of species of hola metabola, so many of them. So it's those kind of bursts have led there to be kind of this exponentially high number of, of species compared to mammals or birds. Right, right. okay, cool. Um, Karma had this, I think this is a great question too. Does insect diversity relate to bird diversity? Oh, well, I mean, maybe the other way around. Um, mm -hmm. Certainly there are a lot of birds that really we think will be really threatened or vulnerable um, when their primary food source um, is gone. Many birds are insectivores, but others just kind of rely on insects on their migratory routes. And so if we do see the predicted, you know, continued decline of insect numbers, we, you know, predict that bird numbers will fall. Yeah, okay, thank you. And let's see, let's take, this is an important one from Ji Ming, who would like to know whether it's true that a cockroach can live without its head for a week. 
Well, cockroaches can, I don't know if it's for a whole week, but they definitely can live for long periods of time oh, wow. uh, without their head. Um, they have these really long ganglia, um, these axons that kind of go down. You can diddle with them. You can cut, you can, they're actually very good subjects to dissect. So you can cut them open and diddle with them and kind of see how their legs and, and things move. And you can cut off their head and, and then you can still keep diddling with the nerves, you know, messing around with them and, and they'll function. They, they don't really have a centralized brain. It's kind of these clusters of ganglia uh, that you can fiddle with, uh, you know, for, for some time. Wild. They're remarkable. <laughs> yeah, wild. Okay. Um, let's see here. I'll just take a couple more. Let's do There's some really good questions coming in. Um, Jesse and others would like to know where did dragonflies and damselflies get their names? Ah, well, damselflies presumably is from the patriarchy that thinks that women need to be five pounds under a healthy weight. <laughs> so because, <laughs> because they're very slender in their abdomens, they're called damsels. Um, but dragonflies, I think it's because of the, the legend, I guess, or myth about St. George that slayed a dragon and it turned into a fly and they called it a devil's fly. But then the oh. translation to English, it gets called a dragonfly. Um, of course, there's different names for dragonflies in different languages, and some have very positive connotations and some have very negative connotations. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a lot of lore, like Darners is a name for dragonflies in English, a common name, um, because of this myth that they would sew your lips shut because of the overpositor, because of the egg laying yeah. apparatus, which yeah. looks like a needle. Um, That's always horrifying. <laughs> But they actually would never do that. Um, and then in Japan, for example, like one of the names for the island of Japan is actually Island of Dragonflies because there's a very positive story about a dragonfly eating a horsefly that had bitten the emperor Hiro. Uh, and he was so excited that he named um, Island of Dragonflies. So there's a, a, a positive negative, positive negative. Yeah. Okay. Across humans. That's so cool. I didn't know those stories. Um, so Elia asks, I think what she's asking is, there, is there kind of one place in the world that generates, um, like in the way that, it's a long question, in the way that islands kind of create really unique species or species that are much different than others, are there, is there any place in the world that's driving that kind of really impressive dragonfly diversity? Um, well, that's a good question. I mean, there certainly is really high diversity in um, the tropics. Mm -hmm. So whether you're in the Western or Eastern hemisphere, the tropics tend to have the highest diversity of dragonflies and damselflies. And in part, that could be kind of lots of niche, lots of habitat. Um, uh, it, we're not exactly sure. I mean, most of the world, I mean, I actually have a bunch of fossils right here from Antarctica. Uh, most of the world was hot at one time and dragonflies and damselflies have been around for a long time. Um, so when Pangaea was still one giant supercontinent, there were dragonfly like things flying around. Um, and what we're seeing now are just kind of these pockets of things that still persist today. Oh, that's wild. Are the fossils easy to see or are they not things you should just pick up and haul around? Uh, I'm terrified to touch them because they are <laughs> Because they're from an Antarctica, and they're they. I mean, there's these dragonflies. They're so. And I opened them when the package arrived, and I, uh, you know, just I opened it and then I closed it right away. And I thought, I, am I special enough to touch these? I don't know. These are they're remarkable. They're, they're, I mean, they've been around for a long time, and it's just it's amazing to me uh, what we can find from fossils. It's like a time machine. That's so cool. Do you think that you'll post them on your Twitter? Because I was gonna I was gonna add your your Twitter. Um, oh yeah. Yeah, okay. well, we're, my, we're working on describing them. They're from the okay, great. I'm going to go Jessica on Twitter in the comments right now. There you go, everybody. Okay, so I'll do this last question. And this one is from YouTube user Omnipresent Millipede, who says, I'm 14 and doing what I can to learn about insects. And this was super helpful. Do you have any advice for next gen wannabe entomologist at that kind of st life stage in the teen years or high school years? Absolutely. So it is not too early to get in. If you like research or if you think you might like research, it's not too early to get involved. Um, lots of us, myself included, uh, we actually try and get high school students to work with us in the summers, um, as well as uh, many programs like the American Museum is one. Um, they actually will have 
you know, throughout the school year. Uh, but for these high school programs, there are, you know, NSF REU site programs um, that you can look up, NSF REU. They love acronyms. Mm -hmm. um, but there's high school, some of them, like the American Museum, have high school uh, components. Um, you can actually go and work with someone for the summer and they'll pay you. Um, and you can try out doing research and see if you like it. Um, and then if you do, you know, societies like the American, um, like the uh, Entomological Society of America or the World Dragonfly Association. I'm hoping you like dragonflies. Um, <laughs> you know, they have all sorts of activities and 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 even special programming um, for younger entomologists. Mm -hmm. um, and then you can go to meetings. So there's society meetings like the Dragonfly Society of America. Not that I'm just pushing dragonflies, but they actually have regional meetings. So there's ones that meet in the Northeast and the Southeast and ones yeah. that meet in Iowa. Um, and it kind of, you know, is a great way to meet other entomologists. And uh, they can also give you some guidance on, on things that they know are happening when people are going out to collect. You can go join them and collect in the field. Um, and that can be a really good way to network too. Yeah, that's awesome advice. And really, wherever you are, if you check your local museum, like the Academy, California Academy of Sciences has programs for high schools and undergrads, and most other museums do as well. So that's a really good resource. Um, OK, the questions aren't stopping, but I feel like we should probably wrap it up. So I will just say um, thank you to all the viewers who watched today. And thank you especially for supporting the museums, no matter where you are. Um, we all could use that help these days. And I'm going to put a link for um, upcoming Breakfast Club chat talks as well. And hopefully we'll get more AM and H curators on here, but it's been so fun to do this like cross-streamed event today. And Jessica, you know, we always, always, always want you back as soon as you can stand to see your face again. So um, thank you so much for doing this and thank you all who were with us today. Thanks for having me, Laurel. This is really a pleasure. Let's start our band, Chaotic Zygoptera. Right, band just stay, stay on this call. Stay on this call, we'll talk about it.